History Town was made possible by... It's 1862. You are hand-digging through layers of frustrating gravel, hoping and praying the next shovel stroke will expose a fortune in gold. Everyone says it's crazy, but there's too much at stake. Then, just when the outcome seems impossibly bleak, the ground begins to pay. The lead is struck, and the greatest creekside placer gold deposit the world has ever seen is suddenly yours for the taking. This is Barkerville's story. For more information, visit Barkerville.ca. Barkerville, a national historic site of Canada. You found History Town. You found History Town. You found History Town. You found History Town. Hey, you found History Town. Page one. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the History Town Podcast. My name is Matthew Quick, and I will be your host. Uh, On this podcast, we like to talk with historical interpreters, historians, and find out who they are. Because that's the question you get asked a lot when you're a historical interpreter. Who are you? Why are you so fascinated in history? Well, that's the journey I'm going to take you on. And we're going to begin this journey by talking with James Douglas and his lovely wife, Danette Boucher, of both who have been interpreters and heavily involved with Barkerville. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a cup of coffee from the Mason and Daily, bookmark your page in the Barkerville book by Richard Wright, and enjoy History Town. Here with me is James Douglas. James Douglas is the Manager of Visitor Experiences and Public Relations in Barkerville Historic Town and Park. James, how are you today? I'm doing great, Matt. How are you? I'm doing very well, very well. Now, on our first episode, I think it's best that we just explain what we'll be doing here on this podcast. Uh, you see, I've been always been fascinated with historical interpreters, mainly because I was one in Barkerville Historic Town and Park, as you were as well, sir. I was indeed. Uh, 1998 was my first season. Now, do you remember the first person you betrayed? Uh, yes, it was actually a crooked mine owner named uh, Nigel Crookshank, of all things. Um, a, he was uh, the, the leader of a band of uh, miners who were looking to sell bogus shares in a functioning mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we invited audience members in to come, and uh, we bestowed them with a variety of characters. And then we tried to show them the inner workings of deep shaft mining and the fully functioning uh, 15-foot Cornish water wheel that... Uh, is uh, along the side of the creek at Barkerville. And uh, and then, of course, at the end of the show, we actually find some gold, so we chase everybody off with picks and shovels. It's a, it's a grand old time. I'd like you to be able to tell us a little something about Barkerville, just so our listeners understand, because I'll be referencing it multiple times. And who best to explain what Barkerville is than James Douglas? Why, thank you very much, Matt. Um, Well, Barkerville Historic Town and Park, the full name, we just refer to it as Barkerville, is the largest living history site in Western North America. So we're an 1,100-acre park, um, not a provincial park in British Columbia. It's actually under the Heritage Conservation Act, so we have a whole separate section for our park boundaries. But within that 1,100-acre park is 135 restored wooden buildings uh, dating from two various gold rush times in in British Columbia's caribou history. So the mid-1860s, which was the original caribou gold fields strike, uh, which created a trillion-dollar industry, or the equivalent of a trillion-dollar industry within British Columbia. And then the 1930s gold rush, would ha- which happened a little bit later, and that was when miners were going actually inside of the mountains that had previously shed gold nuggets uh, through various kinds of erosion, like glaciation. Um, that's what the placer miners of the 1860s were looking for, free gold nuggets in gravel. Not free, of course. <laughs> Uh, They spent a lot of money trying to get that gold, but floating free within the gravel. The hard rock years of the 1930s and 1940s, that's when people were going right into the mountains, ripping out quartz veins, bathing them in cyanide, and then breaking everything down to its elements so that they could run a mercury amalgam process and pour gold bricks uh, from that recovered ore. So Barkerville basically interprets or educates um, the visiting public about various aspects of those two specific gold rushes and, and all the small boom and bust rushes in between. And how we do it is that we have seven different educational zones within this full-size restored wooden town. Um, 107 of those 135 wooden structures are original, by the way, between anywhere between about 1869 and about 1935. 
And so the seven different educational zones each deal with a specific aspect of gold rush living. So as we previously talked about, uh, we have the mining demonstrations that deals with the industrial aspect of the gold rush life. Um, we have the domestic sort of school time for the families that were there, plus the things like the Wendell House, which show people uh, the traditional cooking methods, cleaning methods, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a very robust early justice program that speaks directly to um, sort of the development of law and order in British Columbia during the original gold rush. Um, part of that takes place at the Richfield Courthouse, which is the oldest surviving wooden courthouse in British Columbia that is still a commissionable courthouse. Every now and again, um, law teams come in and actually have appellate courts or often citizenship courts at the Richfield Courthouse. Uh, we have a, a robust Chinatown program as well. About 50% of Barkerville's main population during the first gold rush, there was about 6,000 people living in this valley mining gold in the 1860s and 70s, and about 50% of those people uh, were of Chinese origin. 95% um, of that population was specifically from Guangdong province in southern China. So we deal a lot with the history of the Chinese emigration uh, to British Columbia. Uh, we have also the socio and economic um, business leaders in town. So the main street interpretation program, as we call it, uh, deals with mine companies, mine owners, business owners, saloon keepers, um, some of the social aspects of the town, like the Caribou Amateur Dramatic Association, which was a community theater that was developed in Barkerville in 1865, just recently celebrated its 150th anniversary. Wow. We have, we have the Caribou Sentinel newspaper, which speaks to sort of the proliferation and development of media in the gold rush in the late Victorian era. The Sentinel newspaper actually celebrated its 150th anniversary last year as well. And while it was functioning in Barkerville, it had a 10-year run, which was uh, unheard of in a, in a gold camp um, at that time. So it's a, it's a large, vibrant heritage site, really. It's, it's one of the more important heritage sites in B.C specifically dealing with the early days of British Columbia's development as a colony of Britain and then ultimately as a province in the Dominion of Canada. And we invite people to come um, from May to September and then into the fall and winter as well. But our main uh, interpretive season is May to September. We see an average of 60,000 visitors a summer. And our goal is to not only teach them about what the gold rush was all about, but also give them a good time while they're doing it. It's a, it's a fa family vacation destination uh, that is, uh, is really a, a great place to, to spend some time uh, during the summer months. One of the best. Thank you very much. James. James Douglas, Manager of Visitor Experiences for Barkerville Historic Town and Park. So, if you lived in the 1870s and had the misfortune of being caught committing a crime in Barkerville right after the judge had left town, you could rest secure in the knowledge that you would be languishing in jail until the judge returned the following year, and your trial would happen in one day. Swift justice visit Barkerville. For more information, visit Barkerville.ca. Barkerville, a National Historic Site of Canada. My first guest is Danette Boucher, who works as a street interpreter in Barkerville. We talk about starting out as an actor, coming to Barkerville, historium, raising twins, and the changes she's seen as an interpreter these last 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Danette Boucher. Hi, Danette. Hi, Matt. How are you this morning? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. Uh, I want to start with a story. I always start with a story because I think it's just it's fun because I want people to know how fun you are. All right. You are you are hilarious. <laughs> You're not only Queen Victoria mm -hmm. because when people see you, they might be like, "Oh, that's Queen Victoria, very proper." Mm -hmm. It is full regalia. But I know uh, sometimes I see a fun Miss Wilson come through, mm -hmm. and actually, most time, ninety nine percent of the time, Miss Wilson comes through. And she's fun, and she's lovely. And a lot of times when this town tour would be coming up the street, when we were working at the Theatre yeah. Royal, we would be sitting on the boardwalk, and we'd try to think of funny things to do. Mm -hmm. so that would be, people would interrupt us as the tour on tour would go by. Yeah. And my favorite was always the fake argument we'd either be having. <laughs> Like, we pretend that we were having a fake argument, and then people would show up, and we'd be like that couple at a party, be like, hi, how are you? <laughs> 
oh, this is the theater. And then we go back to like staring at each other, yeah. like awkward, like it's just so like funny negative energy that people would be <laughs> like, what's what's the story with those guys? <laughs> And that's what I love about Barkerville is that mm -hmm. people just walk through and they're just like, these random occurrences are happening. So you currently are in Barkerville. I am. You have, you have been working. Uh, so I was trying to do the numbers. And then I think you'd probably be the best one to do the numbers is that I know you working in Barkerville from uh, when I worked with you, it was 2010. Mm -hmm. And then you were at the Theater Royal for two, three seasons after uh -huh. that. And then you went on to then the street contract mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. as an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Now I say street interpreter. I say streeter. Can you tell everyone? And this is why not only because of who you are, but I think you're the best one to explain what a historical interpreter does, especially in the town of Barkerville. What is an in historical interpreter? Uh, well, um, interpretation is uh, the museology term, the term museums use uh, to describe the people who uh, bring the stories to life for the tourists or for the visitors, uh, but it's not necessarily all first-person historical interpretation, as you know. Um, sometimes you can have a third-person interpreter, natural history interpreter, uh, but in the case of Barkerville, most of the interpreters are first-person, which means uh, we are actors who uh, take on roles or characters, historically documented or composite characters that are authentic to the period. And um, we use our acting skills uh, tied with our own personal um, interpretation skills uh, to um, tell the story of the site that we work at. And who you're currently interpreting? It's Miss Florence Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, I did my some of my research courtesy of Richard Wright, and his lovely book. Very good. <laughs> it's a good I have ad. the new copy. <laughs> I, I also have it on my iPad as well because mm -hmm. I'm a wild and crazy guy like that. I like to have the hard copy. I like to have the digital. <laughs> uh, Miss Florence Wilson, a uh, member of the Caribou Amateur Dramatic Association, so an actress, mm -hmm. so much like yourself, an actress. I can just give you the bio if you want. That would be the All best. Right. <laughs> And I can give you my bio too if you want. Uh, so Miss Wilson, um, I mean, like any historically documented character, it's an ongoing process, figuring out exactly who she was, which is one of the most fun things about interpretation is it's just this ongoing puzzle that you're always trying to solve. But um, Miss Wilson came to North America on the first bride ship in 1862, and the bride ships were sort of a short-lived attempt to import British women to the colony of British Columbia. Uh, she went to Fort Victoria, uh, started making clothes for people. Uh, there's some um, invoices from the clothes she made for different families in Victoria. And then she went on uh, to have the great adventure of coming up to the gold rush in 1864 and stayed in Barkerville till at least 1875. After that, we lose, uh, we lose her trail a little bit, mostly because the Caribou Sentinel stops printing at that time. Uh, but while she's in Barkerville, um, she starts the Caribou Amateur Dramatic Association. She starts the Caribou Literary Institute, which actually makes her the very first librarian in the history of mainland British Columbia. Uh, and she has a saloon called Miss Wilson Saloon, which burns down in the Great Fire of 1868. And then she rebuilds as the Phoenix Saloon. Uh, now, a couple of um, interesting points have come up about her life in the last few years, one is that we recently found out that she um, went to St. Petersburg, Russia, before she came to the gold rush as well. Wow. And we also found out uh, a little bit more about who her family is. For many years, we didn't know anything. And then very recently, we have discovered uh, that she was probably the daughter of a barrister and also a woman who was quite um, socially... Um, concerned with her place in society and was, as far as we can tell, friends with Charles Dickens. Her mother was. And we have actually worked out that uh, she, uh, Florence Wilson wrote a book of poetry when she was a teenager that you can actually find on the internet. And so her mother was seemed to be almost like a Victorian stage mother and was sort of pushing Florence somewhat into these adventures. So uh, for years, we kind of wondered if she was as upper class as we were assuming her to be, 
in, and as we were interpreting her in Barkerville. And now, uh, over the past couple of years, some clues have started to emerge that she actually was a pretty mm-hmm. upper status uh, young woman when she left England. And what was the last, uh, you said that the last time that she really appeared was in 1875. Uh, was there no trace of her after that? Well, yeah. So w- that's the one thing we're sort of really hoping there'll some clues will come up about what happens to her after she leaves Barkerville. And um, the Caribou Sentinel, as you will know, Matt, is one of the biggest pieces of museology that we use in Barkerville. And it stops running the presses in 1875, which means uh, after that, a lot of people's trails go cold because it was the thing that was keeping track of everyone. So in 1875, the last uh, mention we have of in the Caribou Sentinel is that Miss Wilson, something like Miss Wilson begs you to come to her new establishment on Lightning Creek. And she was a publican by trade, a saloon keeper. So in all likelihood, she opened a saloon on Lightning Creek somewhere and moved away from Barkerville. And after that, we simply have no more references to her. So she may have gotten married, her name may have changed, she may have died, she may have gone back to England. We really just don't know at this point. Now, this past winter, we were contacted by a woman in Australia who um, seems to have a really um, a reliable family lore that Miss Wilson is one of her sort of great, great, great aunts. And so wow. we're really hoping that once we can really get together with her and talk to her, that she actually might have some of the clues to these things we've been, that have just been this huge question mark for years and years and years. That's what I love about Barkerville mm-hmm. too, is that since, because of how interactive it is, mm-hmm. I, I remember, um, I think it was Mrs. Hall, uh, Christina Patterson mm-hmm. was the school teacher and somebody walked up and it was an elderly gentleman and he goes, oh yeah, no, that's a family member of mine. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you one other story because there's another um, story that, uh, because if you just hear one piece of information, you question it, you know, because people get things wrong or family lore gets twisted a bit. Uh, So you always want to really accept things that people just randomly tell you about your character, but you also want to have some healthy skepticism in there just to make sure that you don't blindly accept something without verifying it. So a couple of years ago, uh, probably about five years ago, Richard Wright uh, discovered a a little piece of a diary. And in the diary, this fellow was just sort of talking about the citizens of Barkerville. And he said, uh, Florence Wilson is um, has ties to Russia, the Russian royal family through service, which we were like, that's a weird little thing to say. And she's... Um, she lives with this blacksmith named Samuel Tompkins. So the thing that we initially found really interesting was that she, you know, she was living with a man, which makes sense because she was a successful businesswoman. So she wouldn't have wanted to get married uh, because her husband could claim really her business. Uh, So it does make sense for her to not get married and to be living with someone, but it did sort of shock us because of Victorian morals and values, uh, but Gold Rush Society was sort of its own its own milieu. Uh, so we kind of put that little Russian reference, you know, in a file in our minds for a while. And then our curator, Mandy Kilsby, received a letter from Russia, probably about a year or two later, uh, saying, oh, a woman came here named Florence Wilson. Could this be the same woman who went to your Gold Rush? So suddenly we have two people, two sources wow. telling us that Florence went to Russia, which means it's pretty much, yeah. you know, the two disparate sources, unrelated. It's pretty clear that this this is what happened. Uh, so, I mean, then it was like, well, we can't doubt this now. Now it's part of the story of Florence Wilson. Who's Danette Boucher? Where did you spend your formative years? So I grew up in Kamloops. Uh, I went to the University of Victoria to get my theater degree. And um, in my fourth year, my final year of theater school, I sort of had that um, terrified feeling that you get when you're about to graduate and leave the comfort of (laughs) uh, theater school. And um, I was doing a summer theater gig at the university and I happened to see an ad in the newspaper that said, uh, we are seeking an actor or an outgoing person to play Emily Carr at Emily Carr House in Victoria. (laughs) 
And so I uh, was very, very. I'm both. Of I know. Those. I thought. I thought it's yeah, because that's the same. An actor is always an outgoing person. So I um, I didn't tell any of the other students about it. <laughs> <laughs> That is a, that's my favorite thing about it's actors. Like, We're the most loving, yeah. supportive people on stage. Yeah. You get that uh, little gimmick. You're yeah. like, ah, but I don't want anyone else is, yeah, to get this job. I'm just going to wait on that one. <laughs> you got to put a pin in exactly. that. Exactly. So I went and I wrote a piece for Emily Carr and I went and auditioned and I got the job. And that's how I started in the museum field. And at the time I was working with another woman who was a little bit older and more experienced actor than I was. And we both really loved, like, she would play Emily Carr on the days that I wasn't there, and I would play Emily Carr on the days that she wasn't there. But some days we worked together. And near the end of the summer, when the job was coming to an end, she said, uh, you know, the site that um, the the nonprofit society that ran Emily Carr House ran several other heritage sites. And she said, "Um, let's ask them if they'll hire us to create theater at all their sites. And at the time, I was about 22 years old, and I said, you can do that? Like, I didn't even realize that you can just go ask for what you want. And so we put together a presentation, and uh, and they said, sure. So for a few years, she and I, and then a few other people, created um, theater at several heritage sites in Victoria. So that was kind of my way into the museum field. And right away, I kind of felt like it was home. I kind of landed uh, I felt mm-hmm. more comfortable. I liked that I could write for myself. I loved the historical research. Uh, I loved making school programs and educational programs. And um, uh, I took a trip to Europe and bummed around for a while. And when I came home, I knew I was kind of done in Victoria. So I, um, I thought, why don't I try Barkerville? I'd come to Barkerville as a kid. I loved it. Barkerville was run by the same umbrella heritage branch. Uh, so I started sniffing around. What year was this? This was, uh, 1993. And, uh, okay. um, I ended up getting an audition for the street theater in Barkerville, uh, was successful and came up and did that for 11 seasons. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, is it, is it one of those ones that you're just like, I'll probably go up for a yeah. season and just try it out. Oh, and- yes. It's like a first date. You're like, whatever. I'll just give it a chance. And oh yeah, it's a free meal. Worst case scenario. The first thing I said I'd never do was work more than one season in Barkerville. And once I got here, <laughs> I knew I would stay. And I worked for eleven. Then I went away and came back and worked at the theater for a few years. And now I'm back on the street. The second thing I said I'd never do is spend a winter in Wells, like spend winter over. And now I live here full time and have a house and children and a husband. And we live in Wells all the time. So. You should never, and where did you, never taunt the universe, I guess. <laughs> and you, uh, you're you're married to the amazing James Douglas. Mm-hmm. I love that guy. Uh, and uh, you are like the second power couple I've had on this. I've had David and Christina, <laughs> and now I have James and Annette. So people are just going to be like, are you just interviewing married <laughs> couples that are successful? I'm like, oh, maybe. You know, all my friends are, so <laughs> I might as well. Uh, did you meet James in Barkerville, or was it... Elsewhere. No, I met James. I started in 1993 on the street, and I think he's over here, so I'm going to verify. 1998 was your first year, and then he came uh, here in 1998, and um, I'm going to admit right here and now to you, Matt Quick, that he's just a little <laughs> bit younger than I am. So the idea Uh-oh. of dating him really didn't cross my mind at all. Uh, and um, then... What was your first impression when you saw... Now, did you flirt? Now, this is... Uh, I'll ask this. It'll... If you feel comfortable, right. did you flirt in costume, or was it outside of costume? Well, the first two uh, the first two seasons that I knew him, I didn't flirt with him at all. <laughs> he was sort of <laughs> from the younger, you know, group of actors who came in, and he was actually in a couple of fairly serious relationships. And um, and then uh, in our third season, and this is going to get a little bit sad right here. Um, okay. He uh, he had some. Uh, the person that he was with had died quite tragically and I sort of um, had a sense that uh, I should keep an eye on him uh, when we were in Barkerville because I had seen a few people in the aftermath of grief before and it's really easy to on the surface appear that you're you're just fine and uh, I, I had a feeling that he probably wasn't just fine 
Uh, so we kind of just started hanging out together, and uh, and he, well, if you know James, he can be a bit of a flirt. He really started flirting with me, but honestly, Matt, I didn't buy it. I thought, oh, he's <laughs> so, <laughs> totally fake. Uh, but then we, um, yeah, I, I well, we flirted a little in costume, but not, you know, in front of people. <laughs> of course, of course. No, it's, uh, uh, but stolen glances, oh, yeah. things like that, of, of, of course. course they, yeah. I, I do want to talk about this because... It's something that was on my mind is that you're an historical interpreter. You portray uh, characters during the day and you have two lovely daughters mm -hmm. uh, who, in fact, are named after the gold rush. Well, one of them is. Am I right? Well, one, um, of one of our daughters is named Amanika, and that was the next uh, little gold rush after the Caribou gold rush. And where did the, uh, the other one? The other one's name is that... Signy, and that's just a name we always really liked. For some reason, I thought it was from another gold. No, rush. we and I just was like, mm. man, like these guys love. Heritage. No, but her one of her middle names is Clementine, which was her gold, oh. her little gold rush nod. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are too. I know. Come on, I know. Don't throw up. So, <laughs> twin daughters, mm -hmm. raising them in the beautiful town of Wells, and you have Barkerville, which is essentially. I mean, it's a, it is an interesting place to even visit. Mm -hmm. How did you, when did they start realizing like mom is different here than at home? How did you help those distinguish? Do they get it? Do they understand? Like, is it fun for them now? Well, they, that you're at that they point? are kind of, uh, you know, at first when I was in the theater, I didn't take them to the theater because they were really too little to be, um, to behave as appropriate audience <laughs> members. And as you will know, one of the things that drives you crazy when you're on stage and people have kids and, and, uh, you know, they're starting to act up and they don't do anything about it can be really crazy. So I thought, I don't want to be the mom of those kids. Uh, <laughs> and also it would be confusing for them to see me up there and know that they they can't come to me and talk to me when they're that little. Uh, but when I went back to the street in 2014 and they saw me uh, giving tours and they saw me outside and they could approach me, uh, the, it was a little bit confusing for them, but they dropped in pretty quickly. They understood pretty quickly that there's something going on here. You know, there's kind of an alternate reality. And <laughs> one of the things that made me really laugh was when they were about four years old, uh, we brought them in to meet the then street interpreters. And the first thing they said to them is, are you actors? Because, you know, their parents are actors. So they weren't they weren't fooled at all, whereas a lot of little kids right. really have a high level of buy-in. You know, when you say, I'm from another time, little kids are the ones who will go right there with you. Uh, but our kids were a little <laughs> theater, theater <laughs> sophisticated. But They were yeah. smartened up to the business. But now that they're seven years old, they have um, a little characters for themselves. They decided that they oh. are Lottie and Aileen Bowron. And uh, when they came to the Queen Victoria tea and they met me as Queen Victoria, they didn't slip up once. They were in character. That's... They spoke to me as their characters from the Victorian era. And it was a pretty proud moment for us. Do they ever have, like, moments where they're just like, come on, Mom. Mm -hmm. Like, knock it off. Nothing. They don't break character. They're pretty solid they're about They're pretty it. solid. But they did, um, in uh, this past March, uh, I got invited um, by the University Women's Club in... Uh, Vernon to come and perform Lady Overlander because Catherine Schubert, which is another one of the characters I play, uh, I have a show about her called um, Lady Overlander. Uh, they, uh, this character is from Vernon, settled in Vernon for a while. And so I got invited by them to come and be part of their speaker series to do the show and then speak. So the girls were there with us as we were getting ready. And then James took them somewhere else while I did the show and then he brought them back sort of for the talk back and, and then afterwards just for the sort of casual talk back with the audience. And so afterwards I said, well, how was that for you? Like, you know, you've never really seen me with a big room of people who are all there to see me and they are all there to see the show and they all were talking to me and they said, we hated it. I said, we hated it because we couldn't hug you and we couldn't, you know, they didn't like that other people had felt ownership over me as people do when you're a character, you know? So, uh, but they're pretty good about it, but that was interesting for me because I thought, you know, they've really had, since they were babies, they've had, um, they've seen James a lot in a professional context, but for me, I've been home more than he has. So it was a little bit of 
feeling like they had to share me with other people that they didn't like. Of course. Mm -hmm. We will be hearing more from Danette Boucher and her exciting return back to Barkerville. However, first, a word from our sponsor. If you've never been to the end of the road, you can't really describe the experience of having been there. And if you could go to the end of the road only to find what was, over 150 years ago, its own end of the road from the opposite direction, what would you think of that? Discover Barkerville Historic Town. Visit Barkerville. For more information, visit barkerville.ca. Barkerville, a national historic site of Canada. Now, you were there for 11 seasons, Mm -hmm. and then you took a, it was a sabbatical. Um, you, uh, leaving Barkerville because that's something I'm, I faced Mm -hmm. was it's almost like you're leaving a relationship. I was only there for seven seasons, but it's like when May 15th rolls around, you're like, Oh, I'd be doing this right now. I'd be, I'd be opening the park. You have those like instincts in your body of like, Oh, it's the end of the school season. And someone's like, what are you talking Mm -hmm. about? Yeah. Like, Oh, never mind. Uh, (laughs) Did you feel that way? Did you have those ticks? Did you have those like, oh, I'm leaving something? How was it to eleven seasons is a long time. That's a big relationship. Yeah. How was it? It was I mean, I know what you mean. There's those signposts in your body that get you get to know. And Barkerville claims people. I always say Barkerville and Wells claim some people. They come up some people come and they pass through, and some people come and it's like, Well, I'm home. And I was certainly one of the latter. So I did 11 seasons up here, and for the last two seasons, I lived full-time in Wells. And uh, we left primarily because it was that time when Barkerville was transitioning from being a government-run site uh, to a site that was run by uh, Heritage Trust, and we really didn't know what was coming next. Nobody did. It was a big question mark. And so a lot of people just used it as a natural time to say, well, I've been doing this for a while. I think I'm going to just try something else. Uh, We had gone, so James and I went down to Victoria uh, and yeah, we were, I mean, a part of you is heartbroken because um, the rhythms of coming up here, the rhythms of being here, the rhythms of the seasonal lifestyle uh, really go deep uh, into your soul, you know? And so um, when we left, it was so James could start doing his master's degree in Victoria and we still didn't know whether we were going to come back. For the next season. We didn't know whether we were going to bid on the contract uh, or not. Once we got down to Victoria, I think we both sort of had the feeling that we had unfinished business with the world and that we would probably (laughs) eventually come back to Barkerville. Uh, We went, uh, James went to Prague and did a really cool contract there. And then we went to Vancouver and we worked at a place called Storium. Ah, I remember Storium. Which was an odd thing. Uh, James did some filmmaking. We did some other shows. And then um, I decided in uh, in 2006 that I was going to go and do my master's degree in applied theater, museum theater, uh, because I realized that not only had I been practicing museum theater for longer than most humans had, but that (laughs) I had some, I, I wanted to step out of it and instead of doing it, I wanted to think about it and analyze it and think about all the things that I had learned look into the body of research in this field. Uh, So I wrote an email to um, the head of the applied theater department at UVic and said, I think I'd like to do a master's in this. And he said, absolutely. So we decided we were going to do that. And then um, that same summer that we decided we were going to do that, one of our friends who had agreed to come up and work on the water wheel had a sort of personal tragedy in his life. And he had to back out of the job and we just jumped on the opportunity. James called up Dave Brown right away and said, I'll do it. <laughs> and that brought us back up for one year, which is when I met you. And then, right. uh, and then we left again. And again, didn't think we'd be coming up for any other reason. And then in um, 2009, just after we'd had our children, I had kind of always thought in my mind that if they, a position came up in administration, in Barkerville that I would apply for it. But suddenly I found myself in the position of having two basically newborn twin babies. And so James applied instead. And uh, thank God, because he's so much better at it than I would ever be. And he got it. And so we were able to, to move back up here to raise our kids and go back to work in Barkerville. 
I am soon going to be starting a family. Like that's my goal in the next, no, no, no it's not a break. Okay. It's in the next, is that in the an next two years, <laughs> in the next two years, uh, I'll be, uh, that's the goal. We're going to be, uh, having kids. <gasps> that's, that, that's our plan. We're going to be moving to the Okanagan and all this oh, kind of squeeze, things squeeze. to start a family. Oh, that's such um, good news. And, uh, when you were coming up, when you were sort of, now you have children, was it like, okay, we have this town of Wells. Is this, is this where you always saw it? Small town, children, that kind of environment? Or were you thinking, oh, we'll go to Kamloops, which is like a medium-sized mm-hmm. town, a lot of facilities, everything else, you know, a lot of schools to choose from. Or what did, was that a complete surprise to choose Wells? Or was it more like, we have this mm-hmm. position, we have this, and Wells is a beautiful place, we can stay here? Well, we, um, we, I got pregnant when we were in Victoria. And I mean, we didn't, there was no opportunity necessarily open in Wells, but we certainly had always talked about that if we had children, we would love to raise them in Wells because it's such a small town and you have a more a childhood more like we had because we were fairly older parents and our childhood was sort of free range kids, which you don't really get in (laughs) cities anymore. So that was always in our minds. But when we actually got pregnant, we were in Victoria and we assumed that's where we were going to be for the next few years, you know, raising them there. We had no idea that five months into their lives, this opportunity would come up. Uh, for us, one of us to apply for a job up here and to come back. But we were really happy because um, as artists, uh, we weren't high income and it's very expensive to raise your children in Victoria on the island. And um, that, so that was one aspect, but also, you know, we weren't, we always, as most people do when they leave this part of the world, Barkerville Wells, we longed for it. You know, I can remember times sitting in our living room in Victoria and looking around and realizing that every piece of art we had in our apartment was depicting Wells and Barkerville. And oh, it's know. Uh, I have a picture of Richard Wright, a pa- the painting that one artist did a mm-hmm. uh, did a. Uh, I have that in my li- like in my living room as I enter my house. I look at him. However, the look he's giving is either the look of <laughs> Matt, you're screwing up, or <laughs> Matt. What did you just say to me? It's, it's giving his sideways glance. Right. So I always have this thing of like, I have a coffee man. I'm like, well, I did it today, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> and being like, yeah. sorry, just total sidetrack. But I, I, I proceed with the, the art in your, uh, your place. Hey, you know what? I, I want to go remember at the beginning when you were talking about us on the boardwalk. The one I always remember is when you did the spit take. Do you remember that? <laughs> with your coffee? <laughs> I have... We once we, we once had Patrice uh, Bowler, who is uh, Amy Newman's uh, niece. niece. Yeah. We went and I got her a bunch of brown taffy, <laughs> saltwater taffy from the Mason and Daly, and I got her to stick it in her mouth like it's chewing tobacco because <laughs> she's wearing this beautiful dress <laughs> and a, a very image. She was swaying mm. on the boardwalk, like everybody's like, "Wow, taking pictures." And then I got her to just I just said, "Take out your little tin cup and spit." Mm-hmm. The, the the brown liquid into the cup and smile at everybody and when you smile you'll see the brown in her teeth <laughs> of the chewing tobacco yeah. and she, and always she's like I'm trying to quit. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in Victoria. You have five months at this point. Yeah, you the girls are five months, months older. Old. Yeah. Wow. And you're gonna and was the move sudden or did James go up first? Then you waited a bit, and mm-hmm. then you're like, okay, then we'll come up once you're sort of settled. Oh, it, or was it, boom, we're now in? It was crazy. We drove up so he could interview for the job, and then we decided we were going to go visit his mom, who at the time was living on a farm uh, just outside of Salmon Arm. And we went to visit his mom, and uh, while we were you know, on our way back to Victoria for a couple of nights, and while we were there, they we got the phone call that he had got the job, and they wanted him to start almost right away. Uh, wow. so here we are with two five month old babies. So we drove back to Victoria and, um, we had actually given notice on our apartment because we were going to move downstairs to the bigger apartment. It was a house with three suites. So we had to call our landlords and say, well, we're still going to move, but we're only going to stay for one month. So I, uh, we moved all of our stuff from the attic apartment down to the bigger apartment on the main floor, but we didn't unpack it. We just packed it up, (laughs) moved it down, and then uh, James moved up right away, and I stayed for one month uh, 
in that apartment just to get everything ready for the big move up. Uh, and luckily, thank God, my parents had moved to Victoria um, when the babies were born. They got an apartment in Victoria, and we couldn't have done it if they hadn't been there because, you know, when you have when you're a new parent, it's a steep learning curve. And so I was <laughs> every single day, you know, really counting on them sometimes to come and help with the babies wow. while I finished getting packed up. And James came up here and then, you know, after your- he had been, after he'd worked for a month, he came back and got us. Because you're it. packing up. Mm-hmm. You're about to make a move was, and you have two, five months old. And you're at that point, you're just saying, well, I'll be, when you're, you're coming up here, was there a plan of like, you know what, maybe then once the, the girls get older, I'll transition to somewhere in Barkerville, mm-hmm. I'll transition somewhere in Wells, or I'll just continue writing. Mm-hmm. Um, was that always the thought or was it just like, we're just going to move up? Was it like, we're moving up now and mm-hmm. we'll just make it happen because I know me and I can make stuff <laughs> happen around me. Uh, uh, I think that I probably always had it in my mind that at some point... I would work somewhere again in Barkerville, but for the immediate time, I mean, the girls were really little, uh, and I was enjoying the opportunity to just raise them, which a lot of people in cities don't have. It's just simply too expensive. You have to go back to work quite quickly. Uh, and, um, I, I remember I was in our apartment in Wells and I saw on Facebook, uh, that the theater Royal needed some front of house help. So I uh, sent a message to Richard and Amy and said, uh, uh, you know, I'd love to work front of house. I just probably can't work full time. And their response, and this is a really lovely moment in my life, their response was, why don't you write a show and do a show? And that was just, you know, one of those incredible times. Because when you are a new parent, and you'll learn this, Matt, uh, (laughs) you can lose yourself. And I think especially if you are the mom, you know, because the whole world suddenly, I had just got my master's, I was feeling really happening professionally, and then you have kids, and the whole world perceives you as a mom. And it's not that there's anything wrong with being perceived as a mom, it's a great honor to be a mom, but there is a little sense of yourself that you feel like, well, that I'm, I'm bigger and more and other things too. So when Amy and Richard wrote that email back, I was really touched by that, because I thought, well, you know, they're really saying to me, we we know that you're an artist and that's what you do first. So they let me write a show to do at 11 o'clock in the morning and then work front of house. And that was kind of a step back in and I could be home by the afternoon for my kids. And it was just kind of for that time in their lives. And for my time, it was an ideal situation because it got me back in the door of being an actor and an interpreter. uh, And I still had all this time with my kids. I was still raising my own kids, which I wanted to do. And it's, I have to say, when I, I remember I was sitting with Richard and uh, he said, oh, we're, Danette's going to come in and she's going to write this show. And we had this, I was sitting there, I'm like, man, like, okay, but now I have to step up my game. <laughs> because as an interpreter, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in the, the Theater Royal and I have my like funny stuff going on and I have my shtick. And then you have somebody like yourself uh, about to work with me and this is not like saying uh, any of my interpretation was weak or anything like that i'm not implying any self-deprecation but it's intimidating mm-hmm. because you carry quite a presence with yourself and you have a history and you have an intelligence and also you i mean you have a master's degree in in basically interpretation <laughs> and i'm sitting there and i'm like okay all right well time to start you know uh uh Doing this, and I was a bit nervous um, when I first met you, and we started being out in the street. I was, I was very like, okay, trying to figure myself out, and then I realized, oh no, you like to have fun. Oh, you're yeah. just like, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, we're having fun, and I'm like, oh, this is, oh, okay. And you made like a joke to me one day as you got me coffee, and then about fresh ground or something, something <laughs> silly, and we we're just like, yeah, okay, no, this is going to work fantastic. I am just, I'm in my own head here. Mm-hmm. Parents sometimes, you know, they want the best. Uh, were they totally supportive of theater or were they sort of like, okay, you can do theater for a bit. Maybe then you go on to something else or what was the plan for yourself when you're going to school? Oh no, my parents have, uh, never tried to talk me out of being an artist. I think I was one of those kids who, um, I drew all the time and I wrote things all the time and, you know, I always wanted to, uh, I wasn't, uh, so much a 
theatrically inclined kid as a visual artist and a writer. Uh, but I think they knew really at a very young age that they had an artistic kid on their hands. And my mom was, is a really talented visual artist. And, um, my mom had not gone into art as a profession, uh, because in those days it was hard for a woman to do that. Uh, and, um, I think that she also understood that when I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go into post-secondary, um, I'm going to pursue this as a career. I'm going to study it at a post-secondary level. I'm going to go into some form of the arts. You know, for her, it was, uh, yes, absolutely, do this, because she didn't. And also, uh, for my father, they were they were really just the sort of people that were like, follow your bliss, do this. You know, we're 100% supportive. There was, an, I, And I knew a lot of kids when I was at theater school whose parents weren't that way, whose parents were saying, you know, this, you've had your fun, you've you've done these things and now um, get a real job. But my parents were absolutely not that way. They were 100% supportive. Uh, I don't know that they always understood it, but they certainly supported it and always have my whole life. They've, there's never been a time when they've said, okay, maybe you should now be a teacher or maybe you should <laughs> do something else. Uh, they've always kind of understood that this was the path that I would follow. Pretty special. Going towards that, so you have, uh, I just want to just sort of backtrack because we mentioned something and I want to hear about it because I heard about it from McKaylee Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, who was an interpreter uh, in 2008. Mm -hmm. She was up and she also worked for the Theatre Royal for several years. Yeah. Storium. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Storium. <laughs> and I don't know, uh, I mean, it, Storium was located in Gastown. Yeah. And it was an underground museum like an interactive museum i i the thing was i went to it mm -hmm. but i just i can't recall it for the life totally. of me and in fact i somebody was like yeah no uh like you did you see this i'm like yeah like that was me i'm like oh my god because it went through the history of british columbia and there was a little mini barkerville section how did you get involved with storium well after we had left barkerville after the 2003 season we um we thought, James and I thought about um, bidding on the street interpretation contract, uh, but I think both of us had a sort of feeling like we, we needed to do something else for a little while and that we'd probably end up back in Barkerville. James was finishing his first year of his master's degree, and um, I got a phone call from Pat Taylor. And when I worked on the street for 11 seasons, I had worked under a company called Eureka Theatre Company, and uh, it was a family run organization. And um, Pat Taylor, uh, still a really dear friend of mine, um, and uh, her co-producer at Eureka, who had also run the Theatre Royal for all those years that I was here, uh, they had been approached um, by this guy who wanted to do this great big underground extravaganza, history extravaganza, uh, call it Storium, and they wanted, they sort of were working as managers and consultants. So I just got a call from Pat one day who said, we're going to be doing this really weird thing. Do you think you might want to be involved? <laughs> and uh, so James and I went over and we auditioned for it. And we auditioned um, for Kim Collier of the Electric Company, who's, you know, right. a giant in Canadian theater uh, who worked on the first season. And um, we got offered jobs and, you know, we sort of thought, well, we don't have any kids right now. We just got married. We don't need to stay in Victoria. Um, let's go do this. So we yeah. went over, and it was this underground. Uh, I mean, the first time you walk into it, you can't believe it. It was they have like a mini Barkerville Main Street, and a, a big house, First Nations big house, and a ship, and like a real lake right inside, and a train, a running train that drives in. And I mean, it was a really, really great idea, and it was a really good try. <laughs> you know, they tried really hard to make it work. And so for the first year, we had one show, and then the second year, it was switched to a big musical extravaganza. And people came, and people liked it. It was, as an actor, a really hard thing to do because you were acting to a pre-recorded track with pre-recorded oh. timing, and which meant that you, you know, more than figuring out your character and your role, you were trying to hit your marks all the time. You're like Britney Spears. Yeah. <laughs> and and it was underground, so you were never seeing the sunlight, and you were just doing the same show over and over. So as an actor, it was challenging and difficult. Uh, 
and also a lot of the time really rewarding and really fun. And I met some great people there, but unfortunately they just didn't get the buzz and the numbers uh, that they needed to sustain something that was that expensive to run on a daily basis. So James and I had actually quit and left a little bit before it actually shut down because we, um, it was what I told you about before in 2006, one of our friends was going to work on the water wheel. Uh, he, he had a tragedy in his family. He couldn't do it. So we left Storium to move up here and, um, spend that summer in Barkerville and in early in that, that autumn, uh, it finally, I think the owner just said, you know, it's just, we got to o- shut it down. I can, I can only imagine the rent. Oh yeah. Like that's what I always <laughs> thought of. It's like, it's like in gas town. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't even think, um, it, what is it? I don't even know if it exists anymore. If there's any outline of any remnants of that. Well, that. I think that the last I heard is it might be a gym now, like a fitness club or something. <laughs> Uh, which I mean, and they did an auction and they sold off all these beautiful set pieces. And I mean, it really was, the set was just staggering. It was just beautiful. So, I mean, it was a little bit sad. And for a while we had a Facebook page for people who had worked at Storium because it had been this kind of really (laughs) singular, uh, interesting experience. And I mean, it's, I met so many people through that job, but it was a, it was a difficult time because right from the as the moment that it got going we sort of all knew it was in a little bit of financial trouble and there was always this kind of feeling that I mean it's also one of the things that made it exciting was that there was this feeling that at any minute it could end uh and as I understand it the stories I've heard from the other actors who did stay was you know it was very abrupt they found out it was their last show right before they did the last show you know it was that sort wow. of dramatic and I really wish that they had been able to make a go of it because the people involved had their hearts in just the right places. You know, they wanted to honor BC history and they wanted to do it right, but it just costs so much to run it that you needed crowds. You needed crowds of people coming through the door every day and it just wasn't happening that way. I mean, that's, it's difficult unless you're sort of like in Victoria, we have the Royal BC Mm -hmm. museum, but that's right. Right. When people get off that, uh, you know, tour ships, uh, they they can be directed right yeah. to that museum. I mean, you had sort of had to look for it. You had to I look for it. It's, I mean, East Vancouver, the downtown east side is not a place where tourists gather. <laughs> uh, it was a tough place to work, and um, you know, it was it was such a good try. That's I, I come away from it having learned a lot. And when I was doing my master's degree, I referenced it a lot. A lot of the things that I learned about performing. Um, from that place were things that I could relate right into my work, my research. Uh, and, but it was, I mean, I'm so at this point, you know, when you're looking back on it, I'm so glad I did it. I learned a lot. I met so many people while we were doing it. I remember just feeling a, a lot of stress a lot of the time because we just didn't know whether or not from week to week, we were still going to have a job. And that was one thing that I would say the managers worked so hard to keep us employed. They really, really didn't want to disappoint us. It's a, it's a, I mean, I don't even know where you can find somewhere to read about it. Like, I don't know if anybody has written any, like, uh, have you know anybody who's written a book about it or a book about anything about Storium? Like it's sort of like this lost piece. I think it's on uh, Wikipedia. (laughs) I think there's a Wikipedia entry (laughs) about it. And I mean, some of the things that were written about it afterwards were unkind, you know, as because the internet is not the kindest place uh, that I read on the internet, but I mean, most of us who did it now, this many years later, we have fond memories of it. Probably if you'd talk to us like a couple of months after we stopped working there, we were all a bit shell-shocked and it was all a bit kind of like, whoa. And as anything, you know, uh, armchair quarterbacks, while it was while it was breaking down, everyone had these opinions that they were the one who knew the answers of how to fix it, which is what always happens in situations right. like that. But I think, you know, everybody... Oh God, everybody who worked there was trying so hard to make it work. And really all it came down to was the fact that not enough people were coming through the door. Yeah. Well, I want to, we're almost near the end of our time here. Uh, but I really like to end, what is your, one of your favorite interpretation stories? Now that could be anything. And right now I'm, I can take a little pause mm-hmm. and edit this. Uh, ending on like a nice positive note is of an interpretation story or a moment on the street or a child or any moment that you were like, this is, I know what I'm doing right now is like 
it's pretty valuable and important and awesome. Yeah. Okay. Of being an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's funny because you were talking earlier about when I first came to the theater and you felt kind of intimidated. And I know that I carry that with me personally is I have very high standards uh, for interpretation. I, uh, I feel like it's a really important art form and I feel like the, the beauty of this art form is in the details. It's in getting it right. It's in getting the language right and getting the costumes right. It's in having a strong concept um, within your own interpretive contract and everyone being really clear on what the rules of engagement for the contract are. And so I kind of don't mind that um, people can be a little afraid of me when I first come in and then find out that actually I'm, you know, friendly and funny. But for me, it's because I never like it to fall into farce or silliness or for the details to get lost. Uh, that's just really important for me because for me, historical interpretation has become my life and my career and what I I mean, I hate the word passionate because it's overused, but what I'm passionate about, <laughs> it's like journey. I hate the passionate journey to interpretation. Uh, but here's my story, because I think sometimes, you know, when we get into our 40s and 50s, we think, wow, I've been pretending to be someone else <laughs> for my career. Is that silly? Like, is this just ridiculous? But it's a bit yeah. funny to think about yeah. that you, I think if we actually did the time mm -hmm. of you've been Miss Wilson... Or somebody else yeah. to you being mm -hmm. Danette. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I put quotations yeah. around Danette. <laughs> Danette's the real person. And nobody yeah, saw that at home anyway. So even... <laughs> you can sometimes get confused. Well, and I have been doing it for uh, for a long time. And I have played several different characters. And I mean, I should make clear also that, you know, I've done tons of stage work in between. It isn't, But this is the thing that I always come home to. Uh, from... Um, 1993 to 2003, when I did the street contract in Barkerville, we used to finish every day with a, um, a musical set, a Victorian, kind of a Victorian musical performance on the street. And, um, we did a dance, we did a street dance where we'd pull people out of the audience and we'd dance with them. Uh, and it was really fun and, um, people loved it and we'd get this huge lineup. I mean, we have pictures of it just going from one end of the street to the other. And I was always the person who led the dance and called the dance. And I can remember thinking, this is insane. I mean, trying to call this dance when people are from the Theatre Royal down to the blacksmith shop. We have this la line of people doing this ridiculous dance on the road. Uh, but people loved it. And then after we left, they didn't do street music for a long time. Uh, we're actually mm -hmm. redoing it this year. We're getting it back up and running. Uh, and... Um, People always came back and sort of said, oh, what happened to the street music? And we said, oh, you know, it's just different contracts took over. They do different things. Everybody has to make it their own. Uh, and then uh, in 2014, one day, I was on the street, uh, and it was my first year back on the street as Miss Wilson. Uh, I had taken, you know, several years off. And um, a family came up to me. And I'm going to warn you, Matt, because so far I've never been able to tell this story without breaking into tears. So I'll try, okay. and, I'll try and get through it. A family came up to me and they said, hi, Miss Wilson. And I said, hello. And they said, uh, you probably don't remember us, but um, we used to come up here every single year when we were children. And every single year, our dad ended up being the person that you pulled out of the crowd to dance with. And that's just a fluke, right? It's just such a fluke that every year I pulled their dad out and we danced with him. And they said, so um, we brought his ashes up. See, this is the part where I can't get through so that he could have one more dance with Miss Wilson. <laughs> Sorry. So I tried to say that. So he could have one more dance with Miss Wilson. And so I held his father's ashes on the street of Barkerville. Years later, and they're all grown up. And it's things like that where you realize that you've actually entered into the mythology of people's families. Uh, that Barkerville is part of it, but so are you, you know, so are you, Matt, your character, uh, my character, my friend, Brad Gibson, you know, who played Jack Beeman for years. He hasn't been up here since 2003. People still come up and ask about him. So for me, there are a lot of little moments like that, but that moment sort of was one of the ones where I thought, I guess this was a really good decision. <laughs> it was a really good thing to do with my life because even if I'm not playing in the biggest playhouse in the world, and even if I'm not, my my theater career didn't quite follow the path I expected it to. 
that one family, you know, holds Miss Wilson as I play her in their family mythology. And it meant something to them. And it meant, it certainly meant a lot to me that they brought his ashes up so he could have one last dance with Miss Wilson. That, uh, I mean, that for me was one of the most moving things that I could imagine happening in an interpretive career. Pretty special. And I told you I wouldn't get through it without crying. I never, (laughs) I have never yet recounted that story without bursting into tears. I really want to thank you for taking time today to talk with uh, me here on this podcast. Uh, I I really wanted you to be the first episode uh, because um, you have a passion and you have a passion that, uh, I mean, a lot of people I'll be talking to will have it. But when I think of Barkerville and I think of uh, what we love to do, um, you know, you're the you're the quote unquote queen, <laughs> uh, and you play Queen Victoria every year, and uh, I think it's pretty fitting. Thank you, man. Um, uh, I really want to thank you. Uh, and uh, you can see Danette in Barkerville on the street. Uh, I know that you're there five days a week. You have to have two days off to take care of those lovely <laughs> daughters of yours. <laughs> And uh, thank you very much for all your thank time. Thank you so much, Matt. It was lovely to talk to you. History Town would not be possible if it was not for the hard work and dedication and man hours of James Douglas, Dirk Van Stralen, support of Debbie and Cyril Quick, and my lovely wife, Genevieve Quick. A thank you to Richard Wright and my guest this week. My name is Danette Boucher. I am a street interpreter at Barkerville Historic Town and Park. I play Miss Florence Wilson. I also have a theatre company that my husband James and I run out of Wells, B.C. It is called Histrionics Theatre Company, and you can find us at histrionicstheatre.co. That's it for this week's episode of History Town. Next week, we're going to have Stuart Kaywood on. Stuart Kaywood is a historian, a comedian, an actor, a musician, a street interpreter here in Barkerville. Also, he is a new dad, and we'll be talking to him about all those subjects. Uh, also, if you wish to get a hold of us here at History Town, you can reach me at matt at historytown.ca. If you have any questions, comments, you can send us one at info at historytown.ca. You can shoot us tweets on Twitter. Follow us at history underscore town. Uh, now, we're going to end this week's episode with a song by Richard Wright called Rough But Honest Minor. Rough but honest miner with toils night and day Seeking for the yellow gold hid among the clay Hawking on the mountainside what he does there Ah, the old dreamers building castles in the air His leather-beaten face and his sore-worn hands Are telltales to all of the hardship that he stands His head may grow gray and his face full of care Hunting after gold with his castles in the air. He sees the old channel buried in the hill, filled full of nuggets, so goes at it with a will. Long weeks and months, drifting late and early, cutting out a door to his castle in the air. He hammers at the rock, believing it's a rim. When ten to one is nothing but his fancy's whim Sure when he gets through He'll find his hamestake there There's miners more than one Built this castle with the air Thinks his pile is made And he's going home in fall He joins his dear old mother His father, friends and all His heart he jumps with joy At the thoughts of being there There's many a happy minute building castles in the air But hopes that promised high in the springtime of the year Like leaves of autumn fall when the frost of winter's near So his building tumbles down with another blast of care Till there's no stone left standing of his castle in the air Toiling and sorrowing on through life he goes 
shows each morning, sees some work begun, each evening sees it close. He has all the grit, though his tum-tum may be sere, for another year is coming with its castles in the air. Though fortune may not smile upon his labors here, there is a world above where his prospects will be clear. If now accepts the offer of a stake beyond compare, a happy home for all with a castle in the air. A happy home for all with a castle in